Greetings, parish orphans and retrogrades. I come to you with a special episode of Rules for Retrogrades today with Dr. Paul Kangor, a, a very special guest. Dr. Kangor is an author and a professor of political science at Grove City College. He's executive director of the Center for Vision and Values, a think tank there at Grove City College. He's also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institute, and he is also the author of this new handsome volume. Uh, he's, he's a Tan Books mate of mine at Tan, and he's also a mate of mine who has had his book forwarded by my friend, Michael J. Knowles. Dr. Kangor, it's great to have you on. What's hey, up? Tim, it's great to be with you. I'm a big fan, and, and a handsome book with a really ugly, nasty guy on the cover of it. That being <laughs> Karl Marx, not Michael Knowles. Yeah, well, Knowles' face isn't quite on the cover, but, you know, Knowles is a handsomer guy than Marx, but Marx has <laughs> one of the most savage beards of all time. I'm not a beard guy, and I can't grow anything. Right, right. You're, you're clean shaven there. All I can grow is this little goatee, but well, he well, did Marx, have a handsome beard. Marx probably had several different species of insects and animals living in that beard as well. Right. <laughs> If you read about Marx's uh, bathing habits and grooming habits, they're quite appalling. In, in fact, uh, a Prussian spy police reports his wife, his mother, his children, everybody begged the man to bathe, begged the man to uh, clean himself up, begged the man to use deodorant, brush his teeth. The guy was a real slob. So, yeah, not a, not, not a pretty picture there. They say messy desk, messy mind, maybe... Messy beard and lack of bathing, messy, uh, messy mind. Messy carbuncles, messy boils, right? All kinds of things in Marx's case. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. So, but you know, uh, Knowles. I, I, I'm only a part of the way through your book. It's you're an excellent writer. First off, I, I don't say that to every author I have on this show, but I did also read Knowles's forward together with the forward he wrote for from for my tan book with my brother, Rules for Retrogrades. That's like some of the longest writings he's ever done. He's a published author, my friend <laughs> Michael J. Knowles. And his one book, there, are, there aren't words in it. So he's working on a book right now with words in it. And, and he is a, a fine writer, actually. I've, I've read some of his articles. Right, but right. the forward in your book is excellent. The forward in my book is excellent. I look forward, as I'm sure you do and the rest of America does, to a book from Michael Knowles with bonus words, which is to say right. any. Yeah, but it, it, it's really funny what you're saying. I mean, when when I when I when I read the foreword, I thought, uh, "Wow, this is good." I mean, the guy the guy can really write, and it's so true. Other than that, we don't we had only seen the book with no words and and you know, watch the podcast and listen to. It. But um, yeah, he's a good writer. He's a good he writer. is. He's an author who should try writing. He is trying he to write is. now, and it, he does it with great success. No, he he's right. he's a good man. One of the most polished young. I think the most polished young conservative. On the block, I this this wasn't meant to be the Michael Knowles interview, but right. yeah, man, no, I, I just good. and also too, he's he's unafraid, right? He is. I mean, he is. He's, he's not afraid to say what the truth is, and it's something that you try to do, that I try to do, and you have to do it in a in a winsome way, in a in a happy way, and kind of, I guess, if I have a sort of mentor from people I've studied, Ronald Reagan was the same way, right? So you can. You can try to convince and convince people with a smile on your face and be happy about it. One of the things that's so frustrating about secular progressives is, is they'll say, oh, you're a hater, right? And you, they just, they're looking at you while you're smiling and they're saying, right. hater! <laughs> right. Smoke coming out of their ears, hater! And it's like, no, you're hating, smiling. They're, I don't feel any hate for you at all. But uh, yeah, you have to, as catastrophe abounds all around us, and you know, here on the verge of Armageddon and the culture, and the country and the world Literally. and everything in between, you have to just find a way to be happy, be cheerful, at least in your own life, and, and still fight the good fight. And uh, back to my point on Knowles, unafraid, right? Uh, JP two, John Paul II, be not afraid. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. The political will look at a smiling stalwart conservative and call him a hater the fringe right i, I guess i'd say the alt right will look at a smiling winsome stalwart conservative and say you're a coward so you're kind of getting it from both ends and not right. getting your due credit um smiling does not denote 
weakness. Uh, that's I think rule five in my book is that laughter is war, and you, you gotta you gotta be a happy soldier. You were um, the guy who, in my mind, first really connected the Reagan presidency and JP 2s pontificate. And both of them had that quality for, for all of whatever. No, no man is perfect, aside from the man who is the Logos. But they were both happy warriors, particularly against this cat right here with the messy yeah. beard of Flore and Fauna. What was there's miserable. something to that. He was miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a miserable guy there. In fact, he even said that his carbuncles, he said that um, his carbuncles were at their worst when he was writing Das Kapital. Which, which you can tell if you read Das Kapital, you have the sense of oozing pain as you're reading this book. It's a miserable book. And it, this is a perfect example of how the private often becomes the public. Well, if you knew that Marx was in misery the whole time that he was writing the thing, that's actually, actually projected out onto his writings. Um, I, but yeah, I love how in, you, you, you note, uh, sorry to interrupt you, in chapter one, Aristotle says, Men, men make revolution for private reasons. Beautiful yeah. connection there. Yeah, no, it's quite true. And the, the book you're referring to on Reagan and John Paul II, so that was called a... Um, it's really kind of, it's refreshing every now and then to break away from books with titles like Communist and Dupes, <laughs> Devil and Karl Marx, to do yeah. something in between that's edifying. And, you know, I'll go there and I'll look and Right now, there are like 370 reviews on Amazon, and it's like five points, five stars across the board. Well, you know, finally, I did something that makes everybody happy. Right. right. The other books, you know, the, the moment that they're released, you know, it kind of it kind of goes live on Amazon on August 18th or whatever, and the first review that comes up is one star. Someone who has the first book I've ever read. I know. Oh, it's a fascist and a hater, right? Big it! Come on, and you haven't even read it yet. The book hasn't even been sale yet. But but you can, I guess, the sort of advice for you as 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 an author, as a young author, you've probably already seen this. It's great sometimes to research topics with people that are uplifting. And you know, it's hard. It's hard writing books about people. Marx said at one point when his boils were really bad, he said to Ingalls. It's like the devil is throwing excrement in my head. Except he didn't use the word excrement. He used the word S-H. And, right. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of life that, that Marx was living. I never found a quote from Ronald Reagan or John Paul II. Said, <laughs> the devil is throwing excrement in my head. I said it to people like Reagan. Reagan from his office in Sacramento when he was governor until the day that he was in the pre when he was in the presidency until he went back to California, he put a little plaque on his desk you know, that there's no limit to what a man can do if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Right? You know, ah, nice, nice, pleasant, positive. And instead, we've got people here like Karl Marx, who if he would have had a plaque on his desk, it would have said, Kerta, Faust, Mephistopheles, everything that exists deserves to perish. Right. right? So right. that's that's very different worldview, very different philosophy, and it stems from the very different temperaments, and I would say too, faith, spiritual life, or lack thereof, by the characters by the said character. It's interesting how it, since really the the 2016 late term election, you know, which really really turned the election, arguably the WikiLeaks dump, when we found out that all of the the Clinton campaign was using the dark forces, using uh, spirit cooking and things like that to influence geopolitics, that, that everyone's been getting red-pilled. I mean, it's really interesting that now people are waking up to what's a quite intuitive point of view, that someone like Marx that says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm damned, I'm on the devil's side, I already know this, is going to be miserable. You, you, there's, there's a great line in chapter one where you talk about the misery that he begets, he, he sows, he reaps, and he, he has woven into his political tapestry. It's a counter, it's an assumption that, that presents itself to a four-year-old. You know, if you're miserable, like Aristotle says, you're going to seek to sow misery. Oh, well, one thing I thought as I read your first chapter, Dr. Kangor, is what sort of 
weirdo, what sort of perverse author refers to his own brand or idea as uh, haunting a continent? I, I mean, it's like he's he's kind of saying, oh, I'm, I'm a bad boy. But at the same time, he's saying that the, con the continent of Europe needs exorcism from this idea that I'm sowing. I isn't that bizarre? Yeah, I mean, quite literally, the first words of the Communist Manifesto are, is a, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. And, and it says all the old figures of ancient Europe, from Pope to Tsar to Metternich to other leaders, are, have entered into a holy alliance to exorcise the specter. And that's exorcise as an exorcism. And, and, and a lot of this, Tim, too, I've seen this with, with the very few hagiographers, leftist admirers of Marx who even acknowledge this stuff. A lot of times you only get them to acknowledge it if you press them on it in direct email correspondence because they don't correspond, they don't even put it in their books. Right. And you'll say, well, what about this? What about this statement here, right? And of course, after they call you a hater in names and you have to say, no, I'm not letting you go. I want an answer to this question. How do you address this after like the 20th email? Then they'll finally say, well, he's being ironic, right? He's being sarcastic, or we shouldn't take him seriously. We shouldn't take him literally. By the way, they take everything literally by everybody else that they don't like, right? right. But, you know, but in this case, we shouldn't take him literally. But yet, to describe communism as a specter haunting Europe, and you, you said there a couple minutes ago what people write and what they say, and you know, the spirit cooking. I mean, find me, uh, I wrote spiritual biographies of people as diverse as Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, and even Hillary Clinton, speaking of Hillary Clinton. And I can't even find for you in letters between Hillary and Saul Alinsky, <laughs> which, which, which there are a few, and we have those now, they, those, those are public records, where, yeah. where yeah. she's saying things like Marx would say in this poem, Thus, heaven I've forfeited, I know it full well, my soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. Or another poem, see this sword, this blood-dark sword, which stabs unerringly within thy soul. Uh, the hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, till I go mad, till I go utterly insane. Who sold this to me? The Prince of Darkness sold this to me. And, 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 I, and here again, if you really press the Marx biographer that acknowledges this, by the way, who that would be today, I don't know, because I've read all the recent biographies of Marx, and none of these guys quote any of that stuff in there. But they, they might say, well, he's play acting. He's whatever. If you really read all of this and you look at the totality of Marx's life and his view, his personal life, theology, his other writings, some of this stuff is autobiographical, right? This isn't, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, right? You know, the, 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 you know, this is very much an extension. Um, many of these things are of his of, of his feelings and of his beliefs. Yeah, and your book builds the case that the devil and Karl Marx idea is not just proverbial. It's not an as it were. There, there is a real connection that Marx was. Noting, you quoted two things. One I heard of in the EWTN documentary, that first uh, poetic bit. And the second one is in your second chapter, right? Uh, the, the He meant it, right? I mean, that's, is that, yeah, yeah, the, the, the hellish vapors. I mean, he really, really meant it. Is that the thesis of the book? Is that this is a real connection, the connection between the hellish firebrand of communism and a direct a mechanism that Satan used in the 20th century. I have one, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, Wilhelm was warned in 1918 that communism would be the Luciferian Masonic means by which the Catholic Church and other, you know, the revolution in Tierra and Cope was subverted in the 20th century. You mean it literally, Right, that's the well, book. Well, and, and and the year before that, I mean, with um, Our Lady of Fatima, the apparitions in Fatima as well. So, so what what I say, and I'm very careful about this. In fact, I went back and I and I reread. I think three or four times I say this. I'm very careful to say. Um, I'm not saying the guy was possessed. Um, I don't know that. I I quote others who speculate that he was right, and I I quote. Um, 
not just people like the Reverend Richard Wormbrand, who the Marx biographers would never take seriously. Um, one got one um, kind of one Marx biographer referred to him as a hot gospel or something like that, as if uh, as if he's from uh, you know the American South in the 1980s, like a friend of, of Jim Baker or something, something like that. He yeah. was uh, yeah. no Richard Wormbrand was was a pastor from Romania who was. Who was tortured, tortured. For 14 years in a communist prison camp? I, I, I mean, you know, you don't make fun of this guy, but but you know, you know, he said that he thought that Marx was possessed, and he'd say, "Look at what Marx did here. This is a satanic ritual." And I and I would read that, and I would say to him, ah, I, "I don't know if it's a satanic. Ritual. It's disturbing, right? It's disturbing." Now, if you go even further back, one Marx biographer that um, the hagiographer seemed to all respect, maybe because he's not a reverend. Was a, was a guy named uh, Richard Payne, and um, he was uh, he wrote a 1968 biography of Karl Marx and it, by Simon and Schuster, great great biography. He has a chapter in there called the Demon, and he actually says he said it did at times seem as if Marx was possessed, that he had the devil's malignity, the devil's view of the world, and he did at times seem to believe that he was doing the works of evil. So, so pain even goes that far to so far as to say that, and I say you know, to uh, borrow from Barack Obama, right? It's above my pay grade. Yeah, to say right. Whether or not the guy was possessed, but but you know, as, as a historian, you, you you put this out there, you put that out there. This guy says this, that guy says that. There wasn't a priest there to judge whether or not that that happened. <clears throat> but at the very least, and I say this too. I think I say this twice. It's I actually repeated. You, you, you don't want to overstate things, but you also don't want to understate. And right. a lot of times I'll see historians will say, well, I just don't know if that's true, so I better not say it at all. Well, quote both sides, right? Sure. And, then, and, and, then, and then present all the stuff and, and acknowledge that you're limited in what you could know. But we should all agree when reading this that it's very troubling. It's very disconcerting. And I don't know how far you are in the book, but part one and part two deal with Marx. And there are five or six parts in the book. After that, it's really the devil and communism. And I deal with the prison in Potesti where they're doing black masses. They are, they are tying Christians to the floor on crosses while they have religious prisoners go up and relieve themselves on them. They have priests that they're forcing to consecrate human excrement into the form of communion wafers and shove it in people's mouths. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and use urine as, as like the body and blood of, of, quote, the great idiot crucified Christ and his mother, the great whore, Virgin Mary, as they call her. I mean, Man. there's stuff later, yeah, there is stuff later on that you'll see in this book. Yeah, you'll be doing that a bunch of times. Imagine having to research this card. And, and you'll read some of this. I don't care who you are. I don't care how how agnostic, secular, progressive you are. Read the section of the book on the, the Potesti prison, and you'll say, okay, all right, all right, all right. Professor, you made your case. This is evil. This is evil. I don't know whether Marx was possessed or not. That is evil. And then when you read the stuff on Wilhelm Reich and Walter Durante and Aleister Crowley and Kate Millett and others, you're going to say, at the very least, this is weird pagan stuff, man. This is really, really weird. Yeah, so I know so. the devil and communism, at the very least. And one last thing, I'm sorry to cut you off. Our, our church would say in encyclicals like Divinity Redemptorist, 1938, yeah. they call yeah. communism a satanic scourge yeah. um, orchestrated by the sons of darkness. At its origins, the, uh, the, what we are combating is, um, is of the spiritual order, of the spiritual order. So um, our church and other churches have used language to describe, at the very least, the ideology of Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm more familiar with Bella Dodd, Aleister Crowley, and, and some of the other names you're mentioning here. I, I, I wasn't aware of the forced consecration with excrement and things like uh, that. That, that. That gets more directly or, into the Masonic uh, Luciferianism that black that i've been masks, learning about. black, black masks, masks. And, and, and richard wormbron in his book tortured for christ 
Okay, which which um, again, one of the Marx biographers makes fun of, right? You know, widely acclaimed international bestseller, multiple languages, yuck, 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 yuck. You know, with, oh, it's true. I mean, that book was printed in the millions in, in the 70s and 80s because, because of, w- of what the guy endured. He said, he talked about, uh, he said, all the, all the uh, descriptions of, of Hell and Dante's Inferno cannot begin to compare what life is like in communist prison camps. He said, I had people torturing me yelling, I am the devil, I am the devil. And he talked about his friend, a priest named Florescu, who was in the, the Potesti prison camp, whose son was beaten to death in front of him. And, 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 he, and he said, there are other things in the Potesti camp that I cannot even explain to you because my heart would break. And I remember Tim reading that and thinking, well, what could be worse than this? Right. Well, in the last like 10 years, we've learned. Right. And it's it's the stuff that Wormbron could, couldn't even put in his book. It is stuff that is so foul. You couldn't even make a movie about this because you no one could even go there. I mean, no one could could show people taking excrement and do it. Do, I mean, this was beyond. It, it, it's indescribable what they. Did. Yeah, it's sublime. It's beyond the the human experience. You, when isn't uh, yeah. Reverend Wormbrand? Didn't he also? I, I'm quoting you back to you. He said, "This struck me as an important detail." He said, "It's worse than what Dante put into his description of hell. It's also worse than the biblical descriptions of hell, right?" He which, which you and I take are true. I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to pick this guy's brain and and have his his and, and break his brain. Thereby, but I, I'd like to know what that is. I mean, we are just getting the tip of the iceberg the last four or five years, and there is a spiritual awakening to religiosity, particularly Roman Catholicism, in this country, and it's just beginning. And work guys like you and I are kind of pushing, pushing. No, this needs to go even more into the mainstream. But the original, the origins of this a religious awakening are the dark stuff that people are hearing about and realizing through private letters that that couldn't no one writes a private letter in order to be proverbial right no one writes a private email like yeah i'll right. be at your spirit cooking dinner in order to uh, you know add to an extended metaphor or anything like that when you see behind the curtain email dumps or the the sudden publication of private correspondence there is no way that this is anything but literal and historical, and the forces of evil are playing a role in the 20th century and 21st century in a way that we hadn't known since Nero's day. Maybe more. Is that right? Yeah, well, and um, the no one writes a letter like Karl Marx's father, Heinrich Marx, March 2nd, 1837, where he writes, Son, you're really troubling me. That heart of yours, is it governed by a demon, Right? Uh, is is wow. that demon Faustian, or 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 Ingalls writes a poem where he refers to first meeting Marx as the monster of ten thousand devils, right? Those guys aren't thinking to themselves, oh, people are going to be reading about this one hundred seventy years henceforth, right? They're not e- they're not even thinking of that. Um, by the way, too, and Wormbrand talked about I think it was the the Reverend Florescu from the Pessy prison, and somebody somebody said to him. Why would you endure that? Why would you go through that? Why would you allow the torturers to let you do what you did? And he yelled at him. The, pre- the priest said, uh, how dare you judge me? I have been, I, um, I, how dare you judge me? I have suffered worse than Christ. He told him that. He said, I have suffered worse than Christ. So that's, wow. yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's really saying something. I don't even know what to say to that. that that's incredible. Look, so... Pius, the, all the popes from from <laughs> Pius the Ninth through Benedict the Sixteenth uh, for for saw communism in terms of the ones that came before and decried it in terms of the ones that came after. I mean, Pope Francis is another thing. I want to push that to sort of the end of this interview. But um, the, at, like you say, at Fatima, the effects of communism had been foreseen. Fatima's happening like basically the same time as the Russian Revolution, Pius the Ninth, incredible, incredible. So Pius the Ninth foresees communism, you know, 
you know, back at the end of the 19th century, the Fatima seers, particularly Sister Lucia, she writes about here will be the effects and the ways that it'll shake out in the late 20th century. Amazing. Yeah. Well, are there any seers or Catholic prognosticators, Catholic prophets that are in the know as to what will happen in this quasi pseudo post communist day that we live in in 2020? Boy, I'd love to know. That's something I'm really looking for, and I wish I knew. I know there are websites out there, right? And with different seers at different points, different places in the world. And, you know, given Medjugorje, I, in fact, I wrote about um, Reagan's views or uh, Reagan's interest in Medjugorje. I wrote about that in a Pope and a President. Uh, there's that. There's, um, I, know, I know of the website Countdown to Kingdom, right? I know of that website. I know others that are out there, claims of different seers. But the problem with this, as you know, Tim, is none of these folks are, are church approved. Right. And, and, and until they are, it's, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, look, some of them might be, it might be right on. They could be, they could be the, the Jacinta Francisco uh, of, of, of our, Lucia of our time, right? They could be the same Faustina of our time, but you don't know. Right. You don't know. It hasn't been approved yet. Faustina, who's, uh, we're recording this, her feast day uh, was just yesterday. And she was born, uh, she died in 1938. So she was only 33 years old. And that wasn't, she was, she was the first person canonized in the 21st century, the per first person of the new millennium. Think about Fatima for a second. This is fascinating. So Our Lady appears in Fatima. The fir uh, first time is May 13th, 1917, which would be the day John Paul II was shot in the middle of St. Peter's Square, May 13th, 1981. Right. May 13, 1917, she first appears in a series of several apparitions that are going to go until October 13, 1917, the date of the miracle of the sun. And then about 13 days after that is, is when revolution breaks out in Moscow. Right. In fact, when she first appeared May 13, 1917, you were mentioning Kaiser Wilhelm, who, um, who, who thought that, um, that he could have stopped the Bolsheviks. And in 1916 and 1917, he and Ludendorff, General Ludendorff, it was in April 1917 that Vladimir Lenin is put on a boxcar by the Germans, by General Ludendorff, and allowed passage from Switzerland through Germany to, to, go, to go back into Russia. At that point, Lenin, as recently as January 1917, was depressed. He said, I'm not going to live to see the revolution. It's not going to happen. And then the United States declared war. Woodrow Wilson, April 2nd, got a war declaration from Congress, April 6th. And then a few days after that, the Germans dropped Lenin into a boxcar, put him smack in the middle of St. Peter's Square. So as Lenin is en route to Russia, that's when Our Lady appears in Fatima. It's, just, it's quite amazing. So, so no one else at that point would have, would have foreseen Bolshevism spreading its errors throughout the world, one, two, three different secrets. The third secret, which would predict the uh, apparent attempted killing, assassination, shooting of the bishop in white. And the only bishop who wears white in the Catholic Church is the Bishop of Rome. And that one went down May 13th, 1981. John Paul II had not read the third secret of Fatima until he got in Gemelli Clinic, July 1981. He was recovering. Cardinal Sepper of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith brought him the actual document, brought him the third secret. JP2 said, I want to see the third secret. Zepper brought it to him in the original Portuguese text in Italian, and John Paul II read it, two thirteenths of May, two thirteenths of May. Right. And he read it, and he said, this is me. This applies to me. The third secret of Fatima applies to me. We didn't know about it until May 13th, 2000, right. when, when it was disclosed in Fatima. And, and at that point, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was... Cardinal Ratzinger. Ratzinger. Yeah. Ratzinger. Yeah. And he's the, he's the one that wrote the commentary on it. But yeah, that entire century, 1917 through 2000, the shooting in St. Peter's Square, that was all one big long prediction play out of, um, of what Our Lady of Fatima had foreseen and predicted in 1917. I wish I knew if and which of any of these seers that are out there today could tell us what's going to happen in 2030. 2040. I wish I knew. Did, um, I don't know where you're at on the question of the the veracity of the full 
revelation of the third secret. I, you know, I go back and forth some, though. Ultimately, there are some fucking gun reasons why what's revealed is true, but not full. Did you right. know that that JP two the Vatican published two different ostensible years that JP two read the secret was one was they said at one point that he read it as soon as he assumed the pontificate in 1978 and then other ones say that he did not read it until May 13th you know 1981 when he was at uh, Jamelli Hospital or oh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. My, my daughter oh, went there, too. My, my daughter was in that hospital when she was born in Rome, by the way. Uh, wow. wow. She had surgery at Jamelli. And did wow. you know that, though, of the two dates? Well, well so, so uh, Cardinal Jeevich and also um, Cardinal Sepper. So Cardinal Jeevich is today a, a Polish cardinal. He's literally the, the guy that caught John Paul II. And if you see the pictures of JP2 shot after Mahmoud Ali Asha hit him twice with a 9mm Browning smack in the middle of the same square. Peter Square, and he's draped down. That's Jeevich who's holding him. And uh. he and Cardinal Sepper, and also um, Cardinal Bertone, who wrote um, really the book on yeah. about uh, around 2000. I think it was an Ignatius Press book. They all said that he read it for the first time July 18th, 1981. In so that's what they all claim. I think that that's probably true. I don't see any reason to doubt them. Um, Lucia herself said, as far as the consecration goes, she said that uh, something to the effect of, quote, heaven accepted the consecration. The consecration was valid. So, but I think what could be true here, Tim, is that the third secret, in a sense, or the, boy, what's the better word for it? Um, the larger mission call of Fatima has not fully played out in the sense that there's still more to unfold, Right. So it doesn't just end with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, you know, there, there's more there that can still play out into the 21st century. Among other things, uh, Father Apostoli, Andrew Apostoli, and others have been writing about this, were writing about this before he died just a few years ago, that um, the Muslim aspect of it, I mean, Fatima, of all things, she, she's the most revered woman in Islam next to Mary. Uh, Mary is the only woman mentioned in the Quran. Fatima was was the name of the daughter of Muhammad, the favorite yeah. daughter of Muhammad. So of yeah. all places, she appears in a in a village in Western Europe named Fatima. Of of all things, there's got to be more to it. I mean, she could have appeared somewhere in you know, some village named you know Jake Smith, right? I mean, right. why would right, she appear in Fatima of, of all places? And as far back as Fulton Sheen believe that there is a message here for Muslims as well. And, and two, one of the great recent Marian apparitions was the one in uh, in Egypt in the, uh, what was the late 60s? Zatun, yeah. Yeah, yeah Zatun, Zatun, Our Lady of Zatun. Beautiful. Right, yeah. right, right. No, so and that, that converted, they say, that, hundreds hundreds of thousands, or maybe I'm thinking tens of thousands of Muslims, Our Lady of Zatun. That's the claim. Multiple appearances and and, and also, who was the cardinal who died about two years ago, who said that, who talked about the anti, the anti-church? Cardinal uh, Kafara. Yeah, Carla Cardinal Kafara. Kafara. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And he was told by Lucia that the final battle would be over the family. Oh, yes, sir. Right? She, she wrote him that in a letter in 1991. That's right. Yes. That's yeah, very well, interesting. Think of the, what's the word? Anti, anti, not anti-Christ. Um, anti-church. No, uh, he yeah, has they, a different phrase. I think he said anti-church. Anti yeah, anti-gospel, anti-church would or, yeah. arise because uh, at, at the behest of a new emboldened attack on the on mother and father and the family. I yeah, he, he said he said Satan was 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 in the process of of fostering his anti-creation, anti-creation, which That's was right. a mocking, a mocking of God's plan for humanity for the church. For gender, for marriage, all these different things. That's what that's what Kafara said, and he said that he was told that in a direct letter from Lucia, and he was the first head of the um, Insti Pontifical Institute for the Family, family. which yeah. is what John Paul II was on the way to doing that afternoon when he was shot. In oh, I didn't Peter's know that. I didn't May know 13, that. 1981. Is that not profound or what? Wow, that is. 
Yeah, this is interesting. This is interesting because for a long time I've been kind of in between third secrets fully revealed and and not fully revealed, uh, leaning towards not fully revealed. We talked about this a lot on TNT. What? Well, to see if you can. Okay, a couple more things. Let me pick your brain. This is all non-lawyer questioning because I don't know what you're going to say. But one, I learned that in 1984 at Ali Agha's trial, the the attempted assassin on JP 2s life. He admitted on record that he knew that the assassination attempt concerned Fatima, which hadn't wouldn't be released until 16 years later. Did you ever know that? That one he plagues was, me. So he was walking out of the prison in 1983, and that's when he first, on the way to the courthouse, and that's when he first started singing like a canary. He was saying, the Soviets had me do it. The KGB did it. Yes, the KGB. Yes, the KGB. That's when he first said those things. When John Paul II visited him in prison, and, and boy, I should know this. I knew this for a long time. I knew the exact date. Well, I have it in my book, A Pope and a President. I spent four or five pages on this. Uh, John Paul II was really struck by, by two things. Tim. In fact, mm. uh, Carlo Jevich has talked about this as well. Two things. Um, one... Asha didn't seem remorseful. He didn't really seem sorry for, for what he did. Although he was impressed that the Pope came and, and, you know, and, and did what he did and the Pope's humility and so forth. But the other thing what really struck John Paul II was he was obsessed with what he was referring to as the goddess Fatima. The goddess of Fatima. That's right. So Asha kept referring to her as the goddess of Fatima. And he was afraid in a kind of very Muslim you know, sense of God's justice, right? Not of mercy, but of justice. That this goddess of Fatima was going to strike him down. You know, maybe a lightning bolt, right? Was 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 going to get him for what he did. So he was um, he was very focused on that. By the way, uh, Mahmoud Ali Asha's sister's name was Fatima. Fatima. Really? Fatima. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's weird. No surprise. It's the, it's the most the most popular female name in the Muslim. That's weird. So how did he know? Ostensibly, I've never heard any Fatima theorist on on one side of the third secret question or the other purport to know. Just how did did uh, he? Uh, I, I've always called him Ali Aga. Are you saying it's Ali Asha? Yeah, Asha is. I think the correct one, but it, I'm sure it can go either way. Okay, so how how did Asha know then? Are we presuming? Yeah, that's a good question. I so in other words, when did he first hear of Fatima? Right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I never I never endeavored to think that through, ask that, or try to figure it out. That's a good question. No one does. No, but he yeah. didn't. Isn't it true he understood? He articulated it to JP two or some representative of JP two. I know that what I did to you has some significant bearing on this uh, Fatima event and this Fatima series of predictions. He, I, I know this much. He did in that, in that meeting, that famous meeting where John Paul II goes in to forgive him, he kept bringing up Fatima. He, he, he kept bringing up Our Lady of Fatima, or as he called it, the Goddess of Fatima. Uh, Jeevich has talked about that, among others. But I don't know when, when did Asha first hear about Fatima, what enter his head? That's a very good question. That's it's a, a mystery very good question. I don't know that. Yeah. The the, the real question is avenue to, avenue to pursue for the next edition of a Pope and a President. Yeah. Y- yes, sir. If anyone watching this knows and would like to send me an email on it, a lead. Let me know. Don't send me any junk though. Yeah. Got to be yeah. a good source. No yeah. junk. Not your opinion or your best. Yeah, that's what my my right. my boss at the law firm used to say to me. Like, I wanted the research, not your best guess, Tim. Uh, I mean, don't don't. And there's a lot of that out there on the internet. My 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 audience is pretty good. They they know they know to follow the sources, but or or a priori connections. Uh, anything other than a source must be an a priori inferential connection. Be a certain inferential thing. Speaking of which. That is the mystery of mysteries uh, on Ali Asha. But speaking of which, here's an a priori connection. This is the thing that always convinced me the other way, or semi-convinced me that that the third secret had some unrevealed content. When 
uh, what Sister Lucy wrote in her fourth memoir is that there was a time, uh, I think it was the July apparition in 1917, when Our Lady was talking about what the, uh, yeah, yeah, because July is when she revealed the the three-part secret, so it was July 13th. She said, Sister Lucy said, when recounting Mary's words, that um, she had the faculties of sight, sound, and voice, the three senses, when interacting with Mary. Sister Jacinta only had, uh, she could hear and see her, but she was not using her voice. Only Sister Lucy spoke to her. Francisco could see her, but could not hear the words that Mary said in the three secrets. She says none of, I think she was actually particularly particularly parsing the third secret. She said Francisco could hear her for the third secret, uh, so see her, but not hear her. Now, what's revealed in May of 2000 by Cardinal Bertoni, who is, who is a guy with known credibility problems running right up to this day, he's really the only one that gives us the full account and that's a problem for me because I don't trust Cardinal Bertoni. He says that here's the full secret. It was just the vision. There was no text. Now, all the other parts of the secret have uh, a visual content and textual content. That's why Marshall and me called it secret 1A, 1B, which was just hell, right? Secret 2A, 2B, which is visual content about Russia, text. All that was revealed um, in 2000 was the visual content of the third secret, no text. And that, that, that breaks the pattern. It also breaks what Sister Lucy says in her fourth memoir about Francisco had a venial sin on his soul so he didn't get to hear. And she specifically asked Our Lady, can I tell him then the third secret? And she said yes. So there were words of Our Lady. To me, that seems like an a priori connection. That was always the number one reason I believe there was unrevealed content. What do you say? Yeah, by the way, so a lot of those books all need to be read. And I have them right here on the shelf behind me. And as some of them are very bad um, Portuguese translations. I think, I think the translation is fine, but the books are funny. You, they're like upside down almost. Table of contents in the back. When you flip it over, the the, the binding, it, it, it's it's. So, but they, um, yeah. No, I, I I've read it as well. Now now Bertone claims that he went to her and he actually interviewed. Her. So he was given the task of interviewing her and getting her to go on the record. It would have been at the time, I guess. I think it was Secretary of State, right, for the yes. for the Vatican. At, yes. At the time. Not doctrine, which is weird. It's it, it's at least a little ostensibly weird that he would do it, not Ratzinger, uh, because right. he's Stato. Ratzinger was Dottrina. Yeah, and that and the Ratzinger was tasked with what was called the theological commentary uh, in regard to what she said and what was disclosed, and that and that was published by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, May thirteenth, two thousand. I think into June of two two thousand as well. Well, as, as to what um, you and Taylor Marshall said on that with a breakdown on it, I don't know. I, I, I guess I should punt. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't dispute what Bertoni has reported. And I, I take him at his word on it, but I'll say this much. Indeed, the message of May 13th, 1917 and on, it has not stopped. And, and above all, I mean, what's what's the prayer that you say with every decade of the rosary, right? Um, you know, the reparation, reparation of our sins. Right. I can't say it right now. I say it twice every day. I say it ten times every day. Uh, oh, my Jesus, forgive us our yes, sins. Sin, save, save us from the fires of hell. Lead, lead all souls to heaven. To heaven. Especially, Especially those, those most need of our mercy. mercy. That continues, and now more than ever, way beyond communism in Russia. Yeah, yeah, amen, amen. But, but, but so this is how I'd like to conclude this interview. It's just a great interview, and I, I wanted to get into Fatima with you, but I didn't have it on my listed questions, so all yeah. this was just extemporaneous, because okay. you're, you're, you're the guy that, that can give the most, I, in my view, the most credible account of the mainstream 
account of the third secret and you've you've uh, acquitted it really excellently and i'm known as a guy that like if yeah that goes that goes a lot of this is new information to me and I, i'll process it passionate man though i be i i I love to hear information that's new or crosswise with previous theories I've had. But I would like to say, which I insinuated in an earlier question, communism has a continued role in the world. It's not Soviet communism per se. We don't know what's going on with the Russians now. It's more like Chinese communism. And Francis's Curia has been incredibly cozy to the detriment of real underground Catholics in China. They've been incredibly cozy with China. I mean, um, one of Francis's lieutenants in the College of Cardinals said that China is best putting to work uh, his first encyclical Laudato Si, and China seems instrumental by some clues that have been given in the last few weeks to putting to work the new encyclical, which has some communistic leanings, uh, uh, at least on private property, in uh, uh, whatever it's called, Fratelli Tutti. So, I mean, there, there's a, a great spot, it's just early in your book, on page five, where you say, essentially, more or less, here's the upshot, for the economic left, bad economics are the essence of life. And you're, you're contrasting this with people who have good economics, who realize economics are a very small corner of life, right, that, that are merely a condition for the possibility of human flourishing. And it's a great point you make, and I really like the way you say it. You say it better than I am here. But the point, your point was, for most folks with a well-formed political economy, no similar obsession with economics remains. To me, you, you might have a different point of view, might agree. Pope Francis has this socialist communist obsession with economics that, that reminded me a lot of the way you were talking about Marx. What, this irony that the ones with the bad political economy think political economy is everything. Those with a, an effective, good political economy understand it's a very small corner of life. Um, does I, I agree that with Pope Francis, a line from your book rings true. Man truly does live by bread alone? Or else why the obsession with economics? This new encyclical is troubling and seems socialistic or communistic. It, it drives me crazy how um how so often when you hear a homily from pope francis he brings it back to economics money and class, right and, and it's like no wait a second this, this is a homily come on the gospel reading is about x y and z you really have to bring this back to greed that has nothing to do with this right it has nothing right. to do with this topic stop it stop ah, it yeah, yeah it, it, it it's it's um and and and, and you know, I'm not saying that this means he's a Marxist, right? but it, it it's it's what Marxists do, where everything is is seen through the prism of economics, um, materialism, greed, and and I, and I find this all the time with Marxism and, and and leftists, right? Where they accuse the other side of you're greedy, right? You don't care. No, all you think about is 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 greed right. and money. That's all you think about. You, right. you read the Marx, he's fulminating against people and their greed. No, Carl, that's all that you think about, right? It, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, it, as, as, as Jesus told Satan, man does not live by bread alone. It, it, the Marxists believe man does live by bread alone. And, yeah. and John yeah. Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI said, uh, you know, the, 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 pro the problem is um, they have their anthropology wrong. Right? They, you know, they, they think that if you just solve the economic problem, you'll solve the human problem. Augustine said we have a God-shaped vacuum in all of us. A God-shaped vacuum. It's not a dollar-shaped vacuum. These guys really do fashion a golden cow. Now, uh, Pope Francis said in December 2013 to the Italian publication La Stampa, which means the press, he said the Marxist ideology is wrong. The Marxist ideology is wrong. Tim, I'm glad he said that because that's all that he's ever said about it. There's been nothing on socialism, nothing on communism, and the stuff with China, yeah, I'm worried that this has been pure accommodation, much like Pope Paul VI, Os Politique in, in the 1970s. And the latest encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti, which means brothers, all brothers, uh, direct translation fr from Italian. I was reading this section this morning on private property, and and he refers to he re refers to private property 
as a quote um, as as a as a secondary natural right. A secondary natural right. I've never heard that before. It's In uncatholic. The, it's like yeah, it's like footnotes 94, 95, 96, 97. He quotes John Paul II, he quotes himself from Laudato Si, and then he quotes nothing at the end of that. He's either citing himself on those things or nobody at, at all. But right. he even says that he even says that property is not an absolute or, or inviolable right. Read Rerum Novarum by Leo the Thirteenth. That is in direct contradiction to what Leo the Thirteenth says in Rerum Novarum. Very, right. very, very, very troubling what Francis says about property in Fratelli Tutti. Very troubling. He says really confusing. He says not inviolate, which Leo the Thirteenth used the term inviolate. Everyone, everyone knows it's no right. None of the three natural rights, life, liberty, or property, are absolute because then the state wouldn't be able to execute you, which is which they have that right in a power called the prerogative. Forget what Francis says about that. I'm not concerned about it now. But every pope who's ever treated of the issue after Leo the Thirteenth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius the Twelfth. Even Paul VI wrote something very similar. He didn't use the word inviolate, but every other pope besides Paul VI, up to Francis, affirms the teaching of the church is that private property is inviolate. Francis says in Fratelli Tutti that it's not inviolate. Yes, yes. What are we to do? I, I mean, you're, you're right. He's never yeah. endorsed Marxism or socialism. He's insinuated in several places, and I am also happy for that late 2013 interview he gave. But... Yeah. He said Marxists aren't bad people. He Let accepted me, me this. Yeah. yeah. So I mean he is um so he's absolutely not and couldn't be a Marxist because if you look at the totality of Marxism and the Marxism worldview, it rejects God, it's strictly material. Uh in fact, Marx and Engels call for they say the entire communist theory may be summed up in the single sentence abolition of private property. So Francis would not abolish private property. You know, thank God, but he but he refers to it as a secondary natural. He kind of demotes it and does say that yeah, it's not absolute and inviolable. So, um, so he's not a Marxist, but what he says is very troubling. Yeah. It, it's it, it's it's bad. It, it's it, it's and also you got to see the emails that I'm getting from Protestant friends who, yeah. who are not only actually. Let me clarify this. I've gotten only a few, surprisingly, on this one. Most of them have just given up. They no longer read him or take him seriously. And that's really, 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 really bad. They're yeah. now at the point where they just dismiss him and they consider him foolish. They're not even listening to him. He's completely lost them. They're completely confused. And they, they, they see what he says. It seems inconsistent with other popes. And they're just at the point now where they don't even listen to him. And that, right. that's right. really too bad. Well, what I my project of the last six months, which has put me crosswise with some of my own rattier, trattier audience members, has been saying, "Look, man, look at the the four sacred constitutional documents from Vatican II. When you look at them with specificity, to do so is to naturally see the ostensible tension resolving. The more specifically you look at them, the less you just get on a Twitter mob. The more you actually look at the text, you're like, oh, that's not nearly as bad as I thought. That's not nearly as averse to tradition right. as I thought. That is not true. People out there, that is not the case. When you read Francis's encyclicals, Laudato Si or Fratelli Tutti, we've been calling it Tutti Frutti, the, it, it, the more specific you get with it, you do see it as locked in tension with Catholic tradition. Well, Archbishop Vigano and our Archbishop Schneider have been out there saying that, that you have the same problems with the Vatican II magi ordinary magisterium and the Francis magisterium. I disagree, and I'm, I'm writing a book on Vatican II right now. I was surprised how much the tension goes away when you look at the words. I know a lot of the bad guys are there trying to lace hidden private meaning into those words. I get that. That's what my book's about. But but the tension resolves. It does not resolve when you look at the the writings, the the lower magisterial writings of Pope Francis. Yeah. Well, in fact, look, I, I wanted to ask you, so in your readings on Vatican II, does Vatican II, I imagine Vatican II defends property rights as a natural right, right? I mean, that, that's yes. something you might want to dig out right now and write on that. 
especially if what Francis said is in contradiction to it. And 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 two, I I never heard the phrase Good. secondary natural right. No, that he no. uses in Fratelli Tutti. Have you ever seen that? Never. And, and, and look, somebody watching, I admit this could be my own ignorance. I mean, maybe that phrase has been there in, Cal in Catholic social teaching, social thought over the last 50 or 60 years, but secondary and natural, right? I, no. it, I think that's an invention of his, right? I've never it's heard of A yeah. secondary natural, right? And, and there's, in that section of Fratelli Tutti, there is no footnote there. There's no footnote there. I think that's his term. I think he's I think he's invented it. Remember what he was doing in Querida Amazonia, where he was purposely sidestepping the language as to the, the traditional uh, Catholic theological language as to uh, ordain uh, married deacons and female deacons and things like uh, married priests and female deacons. He purposely picked a new word because it was weaponized ambiguity. It didn't exist in the tradition. He purposely made his own jargon in Amoris Laetitia in April 2016 because it sidestepped the two traditional binaries, either A or B. He's going C. No one knows what it means. That's what secondary natural rights is. I was screaming this at the walls two days ago. It's utterly unprecedented. Thomas says specifically, hum uh, natural, oh, sorry, property rights of a private sort are necessary to carrying on which would mean it's of the first order and by the and way that's in, that, that's in rerum novarum and, and, yes. and leo the 13th and rerum novarum cites thomas aquinas on that and interestingly uh, uh leo the 13th and thomas aquinas in rerum, rerum novarum use that kind of language about common use of property um which francis uses too in fratelli tutti but 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 they don't say that they don't suggest that, that private property is a secondary natural right that's Never. kind of below almost common property, although Francis has used the term common use of property. So what Francis has done here is really, this is a big deal. And and, and when, when I read that in the document, as soon as it came out, I, I was just aghast. And I, and I, and I yeah. thought, I, 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 just, I, I just can't, I can't. It, <laughs> no, I it, it's not communism. It's not socialism. He's not abolishing private property, but 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 to but to say it's not inviolable and not absolute and is a secondary natural right. This is really new and it's bad. It's not Catholic though. You're right. He's not okay. He's not a Marxist. Right. Maybe not a socialist. You'd have to convince me on that. See, I'm, but it what it also is not is Catholic to say that it's not inviolate goes against the teachings of I think I counted six popes, maybe five. In the last 150 years, 140 years on this, it, right? So it is not Catholic to say not inviolate. I mean, as, right. as a prime. And then you're yeah. also correct, Dr. Kangor, to say that it is not Catholic to say that it's a secondary natural right, that there is yeah. no. By the, place. Way, by the way, socialism calls for common ownership of the means of production. Right. And involves heavy abolition of private property. Socialism is the final transition. So Francis is here calling for the existence of private property, albeit as a secondary natural right, in service of what he calls common use of, of, of property. So, so it's not socialist, it's not Marxist, but it's very different from what we've already believed. And it lacks the nuance and balance. Liberals, liberals, liberal Catholics, you love rerum novarum, all right? They you think do. they do. I know they you think do. they do. Go yeah. read it, all yeah. right? Go read it. Compare it to the section that we're talking about in Fratelli Tutti. You'll see what we mean, all right? right? You have homework here. Don't just attack Tim and I, right? Read it for yourself and struggle with what we're struggling with. We're trying to be honest about this. Right. You right. be honest too, all right? Don't be hacks about it, right? Well put. Be thoughtful about it. We're struggling to do this too. It's not our fault. We didn't write this section, all right? We're trying to interpret and deal with it. It's That's a principle of non-contradiction, baby. And also when you're at it, your little homework assignment, I, I don't think there are too many in my audience, but if there's one or two, also go look at Quadragesi Moano. It's even more specific. Even look at uh, Populorum Progressio by Paul VI, yeah. who was known to have Marxist leanings. 
it directly contradicts or pretty directly contradicts some of the things Pope Francis is writing. Uh, Pope Alorum Progressio, he, he, he says, look, private property is good. It's necessary. Um, he, he implies it's it's inviolate without using the term. It's Thou this is just shalt stuff. not steal. Thou shalt not steal means you have a right to private property. And, and Francis says in Fratelli Tutti, the Christian tradition says, I consider the Ten Commandments part of the Christian tradition. And if God is going to etch in the stone and tablets to Moses, thou shalt not steal, that means you have a right to property. Okay? Right. That, that is a biblical right. All right? If that's not a natural right, you know, that, that wasn't an addendum to the Ten Commandments of secondary commandments. All right? That's right there in the Ten Commandments. Thou Amen. shalt not steal. Also, Thomas writes in the Summa that the state, he's quoting Augustine, the state becomes like a thief, even when claiming to use the public power, the, the uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 when aimed toward the public good, the state becomes like a thief if it takes from individual property unjustly. That's now, of a course, rare arm as well. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Is it? That's a yeah. rare arm. And also, liberals, you have another homework assignment if you've gotten this far in the interview. Um, you're open-minded and tolerant, so we know you're still listening. The, uh, Leo the Thirteenth, read his December nineteenth, uh, December eighteen seventy-eight encyclical, first year of his papacy, twenty-five year papacy. It's called On Socialism. The um, you can just look it up, Pope Leo the Thirteenth on Socialism. The full Latin title is three words, uh, but it's easy to remember. Pope Leo the Thirteenth on Socialism. Read that one, okay? That's really, really, really good. And, there, and, and here as well, there's a vigorous rejection of socialism, including moderate or milder forms of socialism, and, and, and also a staunch defense of private property that goes completely against what, um, what Pope Francis seems to be saying in Fratelli Tutti. Good stuff. Good stuff. Dr. Gengor, it's been an honor. And this this book, I, I really mean that, by the way, this book, Devil and Karl Marx, is not only a handsome copy with an ugly, unclean man on the cover, it's forwarded by Michael J. Knowles. Gengor's writing is just really, really good and readable and enlivening. And it's just a good book on TAN, the good folks at TAN. Also, I want to give a, a quick plug to MakeAbortionIllegalAgain.com. This is is a hat you can purchase there. Lots of my fans are going there and making the purchase. It's not my company. I'm I'm plugging it because I believe in it, particularly in the run up to November the third. We're gonna we're gonna make abortion illegal again.com. I would also give a plug now that I'm here in Mississippi, I'd laxed up on plugging my own Patreon account, but that's what enables me to do what I'm doing, which is interviewing great people, talking about Fatima, talking about socialism, talking about the dark spiritual connections that socialism and communism has as against the Catholic Church, its number one opponent with us like Dr. Paul Kengor. But but man, what a, what a great interview. We got into even deeper stuff than I expected to, Dr. Kengor. I really appreciate your time. Well, it was great. And uh, if people only knew, we talked for probably 45 minutes even before the start of the interview about yeah. football, baseball, basketball, baseball cards, skateboarding, me falling in the garage, all kinds <laughs> of that stuff. Yeah, this this is what happens in good interviews. It's like, oh, man, that went an hour instead of 40 minutes, but it was an hour plus 30 or 40 minutes on the, the front end of it. So I'm sitting in this hard metal chair and I need lunch and I'm going to call it there. But it's been That's a real great. honor, sir. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Please come back on and join me again. You got Please it. Please do. You got it. All right. Okay. Thanks. God bless. Same to you. Yes.